Okay, so um, here's where we've got to so far. Um, so we talked first of all about the rheology of complex fluids and also the hydrodynamics of active fluids cast in a fairly deliberate analogy. Uh, for each of them, we gave um, an overview of the basic area. We talked about the general structure of continuum models that you use in each case. As we, we said, it has the same basic structure in each case. And we gave an example of each case um, for worm-like micellar surfactants. We talked about the reputation reaction model. Then we talked about a model of pneumatic hydrodynamics for active fluids. And then in each case, we um, asked about homogeneous shear. Um, so that's where you impose that the shear field remains uniform across the sample. We then saw that if the constitutive curve, that's the relationship between shear stress and shear rate, has a, a region of negative slope or is double valued, um, that can give way to shear bands in a 1D calculation, and then they can break up to a state with undulations along the interface or to more complicated turbulent-like states in um, active fluids. So in each of those cases, we were thinking about instability that arise within the bulk of the flowing fluid, and we were more or less actually ignoring what happens um, at any surfaces um, of the fluid. And then just at the end of yesterday, I talked through some numerical methods which you can use um, in each of these cases. What we're going to do today is retreat back to the world of passive complex fluids. So I'm not going to say anything about active fluids uh, again uh, in these talks for the rest of today. And as I said, whereas we've thought so far about instabilities that arise within the fluid bulk, we're now going to think about instabilities that arise at the surface of a complex fluid. So for example, at the interface between the fluid and the outside air, or at the interface where a flowing fluid meets the walls of its flow cell. Um, Okay, so let me see. Yeah. Um, and in fact, this work that I've done, uh, we've done in our group over the last few years on surface instabilities has been really directly motivated by the fact that, so um, really one of the nice things about working as a theoretician in the field of rheology is that there's such plentiful experiment uh, and experimental evidence that um, emerges in rheology all the time. On the other hand, it also seems that um, fairly widely across those experiments, there actually arise some key um, challenges or what, what might get called, I guess, artifacts in the experiments or difficulties with the experiments that seem to me to arise widely and uniformly enough that they were worthy actually of theoretical study and understanding in their own right. Um, and in particular, so I'm actually going to go from, from right to left here across um, the, the slide. Um, so, when you put, uh, so we've talked uh, throughout the, the uh, lectures about this basic experiment where you put a sample of fluid, where you sandwich it between parallel plates, and then you shear it by moving the top plate, say, relative to the bottom one. And so the velocity of the top plate is shown by the length of this arrow and the bottom plate is not moving. Now, someone asked a question yesterday about boundary conditions, and we talked a little bit about the no-slip condition yesterday. So typically one assumes indeed a condition of no-slip where the top plate should be moving, is moving to the right at this speed. And so the layer of fluid immediately at the wall should be moving to the right also at that speed, but doesn't. And the layer of fluid at the bottom against the plate that's not moving should not be moving at all, but actually often appears to. Um, this is sometimes called a parent wall slip, by the way, uh, for reasons that will become clear later on. Um, and this is really something that so widely crops up through the experimental rheology literature, um, whereas um, so widely in the, th the theoretical rheology literature, theories just blithely assume things like no slip conditions for the velocity and zero gradient conditions for, this, for the microstructure, such as this tensor W or Q that we've been talking about. And really, it seems to me that there's a whole um, field of theory to be opened up. Uh, and as I said, some, some people have done very nice, nice work in this recently, but not, not at all to the extent of understanding the bulk in actually understanding what happens where a complex fluid meets the walls of the, the flow cell. So um, the first surface instability that uh, I, well, in fact, the last one that I'm going to talk about uh, today um, is this phenomenon of wall slip that arises where um, a sample of fluid being sheared makes contact with the hard walls of the flow device. And this is in the familiar flow, flow gradient plane X, Y that I've talked about throughout the talk. Now let's move on to the second instability that I want to understand. And we're now rotating this plane here so that the flow direction is now into the board. The gradient direction is vertical as normal, but now we have the direction that we normally think of as being neutral, which is into the board in this sketch, um, which we call Z. 
And um, this is the one that typically has an interface where the fluid sample, which of course looks as though it's infinite in all directions uh, here, um, but there's actually an interface where the flowing fluid meets the outside air typically, and that interface typically has its normal in the said direction. Now, another instability that crops up extremely widely when you put a, a fluid in a flow cell and shear it uh, is that uh, you start typically a careful experimentalist will trim the edge of the fluid sample at the edge of the flow cell before the experiment. But then above a critical shear rate, and remember now it's being sheared by moving the plate into the board, the surface where the fluid meets the outside air won't stay straight, but will undergo um, an instability that can even result in the fluid simply being ejected from the flow cell. And as I say, this is something that crops up very widely, particularly in strong shear of uh, polymers and worm-like surfactants, and also in slow shear in particular of colloidal suspensions and uh, soft suspensions and, and so on. Um, uh, sorry, I, sorry, no, those conditions are wall slip. This is something that crops up particularly, um, ignore the bit about colloidal suspensions. Though, is this crops up very particularly in high shear of um, polymers and also, in fact, of uh, colloidal uh, dense suspensions as well. Okay, so that's another instability that crops up very widely in experiment that we, uh, that I'd like to understand. Um, so far throughout these lectures, we've talked only about shear, but of course, if you're going to understand a, a complicated flow field within a, 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 a flow cell or an engineering problem of a complex shape, you don't only have um, simple shear fields in those cells, you also have extensional components too. And so you want to measure the extensional um, rheological properties of a fluid too. Um, the way that's often done is by using what's called a filament stretching rheometer, where you take indeed a filament, uh, shown here as a, a cylinder of fluid, and you try to draw it out in length. And then you want to measure, for example, the tensile stress that develops as a function of the, um, the, tensor, the, the, the strain and the strain rate um, to which the um, filament is uh, subject. So that's the extensional strain now, the rate at which the filament is extending. And in order to get clean measurements of those properties, you would hope that the filament draws out in a uniform way, but very often what happens is it necks down in the middle and that can actually lead the filament to snap and fail. And this is something that crops up essentially ubiquitously in extensional rheology as well. Um, so these are three phenomena that for an experimentalist working in rheology are very important, but which actually have been very, in my view, under turned by theorists. And that was what motivated me at least to, to start thinking about them. So um, what, what I want to do, what I'm going to do now is talk through each of these instabilities in turn. Um, I may not get through all three of them because I'm going to talk at a deliberately uh, leisured pace through all of them and, and invite lots of questions as well. And it's pretty well modularized so we can stop after, after any of these. Um, but I guess what I want to try and impress on you is the idea that um, in trying to understand any of these instabilities, it isn't really all that helpful if you understand one of these instabilities in one particular specialized rheological constitutive model or for one particular specialist experimental sample. What you really want to do is, if it's possible indeed, is to develop a criterion for these instabilities happening that in some sense is fluid universal or at least applies universally across broad classes of fluid and that you can express in terms of what an experimentalist would easily measure rather than expressing in terms of some sort of complicated parameter diagram in a theory that might be much harder for an experimentalist to measure. So, so coming up with a fluid universal and easily, experiment, easily accessible experimentally criterion for the onset of instability is a theme that really crops up throughout what I'm talking about and indeed has cropped up throughout the stuff on shear banding as, as well, although I didn't emphasize that point particularly. Um, of course, uh, as a, a physicist working in this area, I particularly want to understand the physics of the mechanism of the instability. And perhaps most importantly of all, in terms of helping out uh, experimentalists is to suggest practical strategies that might mitigate this instability. And we've, we've made more progress actually um, here and here in that than, than we have in terms of the, the necking. Although there are, there are already some strategies that experimentalists have developed like feedback strategies for the extensional case. Okay, so let's go into the first of those now. And sorry, I'm just changing the, the title now briefly and it's in a slightly grandiose way to, to suggest that these are actually the three major challenges in experimental rheology. Um, and I think um, I ran that suggestion by a couple of eminent theorists and uh, experimentalists in rheology and they, they concurred with that. 
Okay, um, so the first of those, then necking and extensional filament stretching and rheometry. So the basic idea then is that we want to now, uh, besides the shear that we've talked about throughout the talk, is that we want to also characterize the experimental rheology of a complex fluid. And to do that, uh, one often uses what's called a filament stretching rheometer. And this was pioneered in particular by um, Gareth McKinley and also Tam Sridhar. Um, from the experimental viewpoint. But the basic idea is that you want to have in somehow a filament, and of course I'm uh, ignoring how it's clamped or anchored at any plates at either end for the moment, but you have a filament and uh, you want to draw it out in length and you would hope that it draws out in a uniform way. And then um, what you might want to measure as experimental signatures is the the counterpart of the constitutive curve or the flow curve that we've talked about a lot in rheology, that's the stress as a function of the flow rate. Now here the relevant flow rate is what's called the Henke strain rate. So what do I mean by that? So if the length of the filament is L, it's dL by dt divided by L. So um, that is the rate of change of the length of the filament normalized by the length of the filament at any time. And so if you have a constant Henke strain rate, that actually says that the filament grows exponentially as exponential um, epsilon dot t. Okay, and then what you would hope to measure then is uh, the tensile stress, that's the force in this direction per unit area and a, um, across a surface that has its normal in this direction. And the extensional constitutive curve, which is the counterpart of the flow curve that we talked about in shear is then the tensile stress as a function of the Henke strain rate. And as I've said, um, measurements of that quantity are very often hindered, often even catastrophically so, by necking of the filament, which can even cause the filament to break. There have been feedback strategies uh, developed by this, um, in particular um, by uh, David Hoyle, work, who was uh, in Durham, actually, in, in my group for um, several years, and working in particular with Ola Hasaga, who's also pioneered this um, extensional filament stretching rheometer in particular. Um, I should have mentioned Ola's name actually here. He's been extremely important in driving this technology forward, and uh, that Copenhagen group has particularly worked on feedback strategies for, for mitigating this lacking instability. But what, what I wanted to do was to, tr to try to uh, understand this from an experimental viewpoint. So what I'm going to do then is um, introduce this effect by giving some experimental observations of it. I'll then talk through a criterion that pre-existed any of this stuff that uh, we thought about for necking um, that was put forward, assuming the filament is a purely elastic solid. Of course, these complex fluids aren't purely elastic solids, but this was the, the closest criterion that was available before um, this work, I guess, and that's called the Considere criterion after presumably a person called Considere. Um, what we did here was look at a uh, criterion for necking, not in elastic solids, but actually in viscoelastic complex fluids. And we did that by three calculations, what I'll call calculation zero, the back of the postage stamp, um, and then looking at two different calculations corresponding to two different experimental um, setups, one where you impose the tensile stress and aim to measure the strain rate, or conversely, where you impose the strain rate and measure the tensile stress. So, um, as I've said, necking is seen very widely in complex fluids. Here are just some snapshots of it, really, in bubbles. So this is no way an exhaustive uh, uh, search through the literature because necking crops up um, essentially, as far as I can tell, any time you stretch out a filament, more or less. Um, but uh, here you see it in a bubble raft, a dense colloidal suspension, associated polymers and worm-like micelles. These are experimental snapshots. Um, this is a simulation snapshot, again, from uh, the, the Copenhagen group uh, with Ola Hassaga as a co-author on this paper. And this is a filament that's being stretched around a rotating, you know, this drum here, um, which you can just see a section of is rotating and stretching the filament. And you can see the filament necks here. Um, here is some slightly more quantitative data um, from Shi Ching Wang's group. And this is a highly entangled polymer that's been stretched out. This is actually a sheet rather than a cylinder, I think. It's quickly stretched. So the stress as a function of time increases, and then you don't stretch it after this time here. And the stress relaxes quite slowly and then suddenly the stress falls off a cliff and that corresponds with a filament necking and uh, catastrophically failing. Okay, so that's no, by no means a comprehensive sketch through the experiments, but it, it shows how widespread this effect is. Um, so how is this understood theoretically? Well, um, in a lot of the experimental papers, even in the complex fluids literature till a few years ago, the, um, the point in the paper that tried to make contact with theory often discussed this 
criterion for necking in a nonlinear elastic solid. And this was put forward actually in 1885, so a long time ago by Considere. Um, so um, what Considere said was if you take a, a filament of uh, material, now an elastic solid, and you stretch it out, um, then uh, you're thinking here about the Henke strain. So that's the time integral of the Henke strain rate that I talked about a moment ago. Um, then you get this observation that the filament necks in the middle. And Considere suggested that this necking must happen when the tensile force, so that's the tensile force along the filament, as a function of the Henke strain, starting from an initially unnecked filament, when that force uh, um, um, goes through a maximum. And then what you can get, because the force by force balance has to be uniform along the filament, you then get a coexistence of a low strained region with a high strained region. And of course, the region that's strained more um, has thinned down in area more because volume is conserved everywhere along the, the filament. Um, so you can see, I guess, why I was drawn to this originally, because this very suggestively looks like what more or less what we've been talking about in, you can almost think of this as an extensional version of shear banding in some sense. So you have a multi-valued function of some force or stress-like entity that can support the existence of different regions or somehow adhere extensional bands of low strain and high strain. So that was the consider criterion, as I say, put forward in the context of an elastic solid. And of course, there are differences here. This is a force rather than a stress, and this is a strain rather than a strain rate, and this is extensional rather than shear. But nonetheless, you can, I hope, see at least the analogy to shear banding. All right. And so in the literature in complex fluids, so here are two papers from the Journal of Rheology that were looking at uh, necking in complex fluids. And you can see that they're talking about the consider criterion. And that's uh, absolutely fine. It's a very sensible starting point. But of course, the consider criterion has really obvious shortcomings. So um, it takes the tensile force to be a function of the strain only, the strain epsilon. Whereas, of course, in a fluid, um, we're not only interested in the strain, I'm sorry, uh, but we're also interested in the strain rate. Um, the other thing is that the consider criterion, as far as I understand it, is a purely static criterion. And what you would hope um, to do in any sort of um, stability calculation is calculate an eigenvalue that tells you how quickly these necking perturbations emerge as you stretch the filament. So it doesn't predict the dynamical rate of necking wow. onset. So that motivated um, a simple calculation that uh, I thought was a, a nice calculation that could be talk through because it's quite a nice example of uh, another linear stability calculation um, as I talked through in the context of shear banding and it's fairly easy to understand at the level of a sort of back of a postage stamp argument as well which I thought was a, a good thing to do given that I'm not really able to do complicated maths at, at the board and unfortunately not being with you um, in person. Um, so let's talk through um, effectively back of the postage stamp calculation for this. Um, so we're thinking about taking an initially uniform cylindrical sample of complex fluid. And here we're going to denote the stretching direction by Z. And what are the relevant variables that we think about for a, um, a filament or a cylinder, cylindrical filament that's being stretched out? And imagine so far it's uniform and isn't necking. So the relevant variables are the area of the filament. And uh, so that needs no further explanation, I think. The Henke strain rate, which I've already defined, d by dt of the length of the filament normalized by the length. So a constant Henke strain rate gives an exponential growth in time of the length of the filament. The tensile stress, that's the force per unit area, the force in this direction across this area. Um, and the force, therefore, of course, the, the tensile force is indeed, therefore, the area times the stress. So those are the variables defined in the context of a uniform cylinder. And what we're interested in here is how and why does the filament just start to neck? And of course, when it starts to neck, um, it, these things can then depend on the direction Z along the length of the cylinder. Um, apart from the tensile force, which by force balance has to remain uniform along the length of the cylinder. And that's a little, that arises from thinking about the force balance condition in Stokes uh, force balance. And that's in a sense, the counterpart of what we talked about uh, the other day, where actually in a shear situation where you're not having to worry about the area changing the, um, the shear stress have to remain uniform as a function of the flow gradient direction in that case. Okay. Um, 
So what we're going to do is a linear stability analysis, which I've talked through actually uh, a couple of times already, two or three times in the context of these lectures. So I hope this is now becoming familiar and I'm sure you'll have seen linear calculations talked about many times in your other lectures too. So what we're going to do is consider a base state, which is a state where we have these uniform variables and then they're going to become non-uniform by adding to those uniform variables small amplitude perturbations. So just we're considering tiny amplitude perturbations. And we're going to do a linear stability analysis where we substitute the base state plus the small amplitude perturbations into the equation of motion. We expand in powers of the amplitude of those perturbations. And then that gives us a linearized set of equations um, to first order in the amplitude of those perturbations. And that will enable us to then um, understand, for example, how any fluctuations in the area, whether they decay in time to leave a uniform, um, uniformly extending filament, or whether they grow in time to leave a filament that necks. Um, just as a couple of other uh, uh, bits of detail, I guess we're considering long wavelength um, um, perturbations where the, the wavelength is much longer than the radius of the filament. That enables us to use what's called a slender filament approach in the calculation and we're neglecting surface tension so that's relevant to very highly viscoelastic filaments where the bulk viscoelastic forces greatly outweigh any effects of surface tension. There is a whole separate class of instabilities which I'm not going to talk about today which is fluids that are still viscoelastic but where um, uh, much less so and where the surface tension uh, so there's much more fluid like um, samples than these where the surface tension where the filament meets the outside air is important. And there actually, um, even at uh, zero Henke strain rate, you can get a cylinder of fluid breaking up into beads. There are various instabilities, Rayleigh plateau, Rayleigh Taylor instabilities, um, because it's energetically favorable to have a bunch of um, spheres rather than a, a cylinder because you um, because of surface tension considerations. But I'm not thinking about that today. So surface tension doesn't play a role and any instability comes from thinking about the physics of the bulk forces inside the, the filament. All right, um, so um, what we're thinking about um, here then is, as I've said, how and why does this filament start to neck? And we're going to try and understand that with reference to this underlying quantity that we've talked about, which actually is what we're often trying to measure when we do these filament stretching experiments. That's saying, imagine we start at time zero, stretching the filament out at some Henke strain rate epsilon dot. And then after some time, imagine that, uh, so imagine then the filament stretches out in a uniform way. The tensile stress will grow as a function of time, but should eventually settle onto some steady state function of the Henke strain rate. And that steady state function of the tensile stress as a function of the Henke strain rate then defines what's known as the extensional constitutive curve. And that's, as I've said, the counterpart of the flow curve, the stress against strain rate that we've talked about in the context of shear. So if this is attainable, so if this can be measured before the filament's broken, in other words, it defines the steady state stress versus the Henke strain rate in a uniformly thinning filament. So it's important to realize here, though, that although this relationship between stress and strain rate is um, steady state. Of course, the filament as a whole is not in steady state because by definition, it's extending in length and thinning therefore in area to preserve volume. So it's a little bit distinct from the shear situation where we can think of everything being in steady state in principle. All right, um, so um, what we're going to do, first of all, is a back of the postage stamp calculation where we consider um, a cylinder that's stretching out that um, so it's time dependent in the sense that it's stretching out in length, but it's time independent in the sense that the tensile stress has attained this steady state value, which is prescribed as a function of the Henke strain rate. So in other words, we're going to assume that the stress resides already on the constitutive curve. Now, this may be unrealistic because, of course, the filament may go unstable to necking before it gets there or at least when it gets there. That's a little bit like the other day we cheated by doing this calculation where we thought about shear bands forming where the stress as a function of the shear rate has a region of negative slope and we started with an initial base state in that region of negative slope which is of course in a sense not realistic because the calculation then shows that that's not a stationary state to start from in the first place. Nonetheless um, this is a good starting point calculation. It then sets the scene for more realistic calculations where we ask about a cylinder that's initially unloaded and unstretched. So we start here 
And then at some time zero, we jump the tensile stress to some value, which is then held constant. So the filament's under a constant tensile stress. And um, then at that constant tensile stress, the strain rate will then evolve to try to get to the stationary um, constitutive curve. But we might find that the filament necks before you can get to that point, which is disappointing to an experimentalist who set out to measure the constitutive curve, of course. Um, the other calculation, and this is actually the more common experiment, is where um, in filament stretching rheometers, the, the stretching is done at a constant Henke strain rate. So you start with an unstretched filament that's unstressed, you jump the Henke strain rate to some value, hold it constant, and then you watch the tensile stress develop as it tries to get towards the steady state constitutive curve that you're trying to measure, but the filament may go unstable to necking before you, you get there. And so that's the second calculation. And I'll just pause at this point to take any questions because I've introduced quite a few concepts here that are not familiar, at least in these lectures so far. So does anyone have any questions at this point? I don't see any questions. Okay, all right, thank you, I'll carry on. All right, so first of all, the back of the postage stamp calculation. Um, so here's the... Um, Here's the steady state constitutive curve of shear stress, sorry, shear stress, uh, tensile stress as a function of um, Henke strain rate that we're, we're thinking about. So what are the relevant equations of motion for um, a material where we're assuming that we're already in a state where the stress is prescribed as a stationary, but not necessarily stable, but stationary um, function of the imposed Henke strain rate? Well, they're as follows. So we, as a filament um, extends at some Henke strain rate, it of course has to thin out because its area is extending in length. And uh, sorry, the filament is extending in length. So the area must correspondingly be thinning so that the volume of the filament or assuming incompressible flow remains constant. And so we have D by DT of the area is minus the Henke strain rate times the area. So this is simply the um, condition of mass conservation that says as the filament stretches out at some Henke strain rate, it must also thin to preserve mass or volume. Um, the other thing is that we insist that the force, which is the product of the area times this stress, must remain uniform along the filament. So um, what we do then is we think of our base state in our linear stability calculation as corresponding to a perfectly uniform cylinder with this area that thins just uh, by uh, integrating this equation exponentially as a function of time at a rate given by the Henke strain rate. So this is the base state. And then we apply to that small amplitude perturbations that vary spatially along the filament. And as usual, we decompose those into um, Fourier modes along the length of the filament. And so we have uh, fluctuations in the area along the length of the filament as the filament tends to uh, next down. Corresponding to that, of course, are fluctuations in the Henke strain rate, because uh, the way we get fluctuations is that it's a region where the Henke strain rate becomes a little bit bigger, that the filament thins down faster. So these are obviously coupled together. And we can see that how they're coupled together by um, uh, substituting the base state plus the perturbations into these governing equations and doing a linear stability analysis. Um, in other words, ex, uh, expanding the, so the base state plus the perturbation substituted in, um, the zeroth order state just tells you, uh, terms tell you about the, the base state that we've already talked about. The first order terms are the one we're interested in because they tell you at linear order what happens to the fluctuations. Do they decay away to leave a uniform filament or do they grow towards a next state? And terms of order delta A squared and so on are um, negligible at least as long as we remain in the linear regime. So um, the linearized equations are as follows. Um, the linearized mass conservation says that the um, fluctuations in area, d by dt of the area, is minus the um, fluctuations in the Henke strain rate. So as we've said, this simply says that where you strain a little, any place along the filament where you strain a little bit faster, you're going to thin a bit quicker by mass conservation. Then we linearize the force balance equation. So just as we said in shear banding the other day, there can be no variations in the shear stress in the flow gradient direction in shear banding by force balance. Here, there can be no variations in force along the filament. Now, so when we linearize this equation, we get that fluctuations in the force are zero, but those fluctuations in the force can also be expressed by linearizing these terms here. The stress times the undulations in the area, plus now to linearize this term, it's nonlinear. So we take the gradient d sigma by d epsilon dot, 
times fluctuations in the Henke strain rate. So what does this linearized equation say? Well, it says um, where you thin more, assuming this prefactor and this prefactor are both positive, you must strain faster. So we can see that we've got a positive feedback here because this mass conservation says that where you strain faster, you must thin faster. And then the force balance term says where you thin faster, you must strain faster. So this is a positive cycle that we go round um, ever amplifying these undulations. So this gives us a simple mechanistic understanding of the physics of a necking instability. And what it says that is that a fluid, that any fluid that for which the extensional constitutive curve has a positive slope, so primed, I'm um, denoting here as d sigma by d epsilon dot, um, must give an instability to necking, at least once you've got to a state where the filament is thinning initially uniformly with a stress prescribed as this function of the strain rate. So that's actually interesting because it says even if you imagine somehow being able to thin out a filament of Newtonian fluid and not even worrying about surface tension, I guess it says that even that must, must neck, although I've only really thought about this in the context of complex fluids. So that's the back of the postage stamp calculation. And I think it's been useful because it says that essentially you're always doomed to neck eventually. And it also has given us a basic mechanis mechanistic understanding, which simply says, if you strain more, you thin faster. And if you thin, you must strain faster, assuming that your constitutive curve has a positive slope. This also um, was a surprise to me initially as someone who comes from the shear banding literature, because of course there you have stress as a function of strain rate and it's the region of negative slope that's in, unstable to banding, whereas here you're getting the other way around, which felt uh, a little bit counterintuitive to me to start with, but I guess it's simply consequence, it's just simply saying you always have to neck, whereas in shear you don't always have to band unless you have this funny region of negative slope. Okay, so that's the um, that's the sort of zero order back of the postage stamp calculation. Um, now, what about a more realistic case that might actually be realized in the lab where you take an unloaded unstretched filament at time zero, and then you suddenly impose on it a tensile stress that you then maintain for subsequent times. The strain rate starts to evolve towards the constitutive curve. And remember this constitutive curve pertains to a uniformly thinning filament. So it, this concept of this curve really ceases to exist if the filament necks before you get there. And it might do that, and we want to know whether it does. So um, because we're not now simply assuming that we can blithely write down a relationship of uh, stress as a function of strain rate, we're going to actually think about a slightly more realistic uh, constitutive model, which actually has the same structure basically that I, we talked about the other day. In any fluid element, you have two stress contributions, one due to the Newtonian solvent, another with a modulus G that is viscoelastic and prescribed by, <clears throat> in this case, it will be the conformation tensor of the polymer molecules inside the complex fluid. And uh, you have a force balance condition. And here we also have to worry about mass, balance, uh, mass conservation as well. Okay, so uh, I've described what we're doing in an initially unstretched and loaded filament that you're then subjecting to a tensile stress. Now, what we find in this uh, calculation, and this is actually a quirk of um, the way these constitutive models are, are set up. And if you solve them at fixed stress rather than fixed strain rate, it actually means you have one, um, uh, effectively one derivative less than you thought you had in some sense. And what happens is that you very quickly evolve towards the um, homogeneous constitutive curve. And so because of that quick evolution, it turns out there isn't actually any significant necking in that fast evolution to the curve. But of course, once you get to the curve, you have to neck, you're, you're, you're on the curve and then you're back to calculation zero. So actually the back of the envelope uh, calculation has helped us to understand this more realistic experimental case too. So the, you then neck as per before, in fact. So we now understand this case. So, so far I've just been sketching constitutive curves. So I just drew this by freehand on the, on the computer. Um, now let's look at this in actually some, some different constitutive models of complex fluids. And I, I'm not going to talk through what those models are in detail, apart from to say they all have the same mathematical structure that I wrote down the other day. Um, and I, I'm now going to think about, so um, there's an eigenvalue associated with this growth of the perturbations, which is this prefactor here. So um, 
d by dt of a is some eigenvalue times a, where the eigenvalue, which tells you how quickly fluctuations, um, necking, heterogeneous necking perturbations, um, so non-uniformity along the cylinder, how that how quickly that grows as a function of time. And that's given by the, at any um, stress, it's given by the stress divided by the slope of the constitutive curve. Now, okay, we may be interested in how quickly the undulations grow as a function of time, but it's probably more realistic that we're interested in how quickly the um, imperfections along the filament grow as a function of the number of Henke strain units that you've imposed. And of course, those two are simply related because this number of strain units is the Henke strain rate times the time. So we can normalize the necking rate to give you the rate at which um, heterogeneity grows along the non-uniformity grows along the length of the cylinder as a function of the accumulating number of Henke strain units. And that's this quantity here. OK, so then what I've shown in this figure here is a bunch of constitutive curves, one for each of these models. So the Ulroyd B is a very simple model of a com complex fluid where you um, make a cartoon of any polymer chain as just comprising a dumbbell. So uh, two uh, points of mass connected by a hooky and spring. And you think about the dynamics of lots of those in flow. Um, in shear, what that predicts is stress against strain rate that's just uh, Newtonian. In extension, it's actually it has a catastrophe associated with it because above a certain Henke strain rate, actually those dumbbells get infinitely drawn out in length. And so the tensile stress blows up as a function of the strain rate. Um, that stretch catastrophe is mitigated in models such as the so-called Giesecus and Feeney P, which I'm not going to talk through in detail, but they both, for some matched parameter across the two, have actually indistinguishable curve that removes this instability. These are all very, very simple phenomenological models that are just right written down by thinking about dumbbells with some extra physics bolted in. Um, a more microscopically faithful model of polymers, which thinks about processes such as uh, reptation and reaction and chain stretch and uh, so on that I've talked a little bit about in the earlier lectures, actually in the context of one like my cells, um, have, um, uh, have constitutive curves that I've shown here. So we have um, the roly-poly model without so-called chain stretch. And I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but chain stretch is basically, we talked about a polymer molecule residing inside a tube and whether it has chain stretch or not is whether there's a zero or a stretching mode of the polymer along the tube is allowed. Um, if it isn't, you have a very flat tensile constitutive digitative curve. If it is, and if you don't mitigate a stretch catastrophe a la Ulroy B, you get another catastrophe. This is with finite chain stretch, but with the stretch being mitigated. Okay, if you didn't understand any of that, don't worry. Um, I'm just talking about here um, six different models of the rheology of the uh, kinds of polymers that we might be thinking about here. Um, and uh, the take home message here is that at any point on this constitutive curve, I've shown by this color scale here, the rate at which uh, necking perturbations grow along the length of the fil uh, filament per unit number of accumulating Henke strain units. And the take home message is that when the constitutive curve is flat, so remember um, 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 sigma primed is d sigma by d epsilon. So when sigma primed is small, so in other words, when d sigma by d epsilon is small, so when we have a flat curve here, this denominator is large and the necking rate is large. And so we have um, a very high color here associated with that very strong rate of necking. Um, so you can see that if you don't have chain stretch or if you don't have enough chain stretch, you're doomed to, to neck pretty fast. On the other hand, if you do have chain stretch and in particular, if you have this stretch catastrophe, then actually the stress increases very quickly with the strain rate. And that actually provides a very strongly stabilizing influence against the effects of necking. Um, and that's because it sort of slows down the, the second part of this, this loop here in a sense. All right, <clears throat> so, um, so this tells us then that following the imposition of a stress to just to summarize at any given imposed stress, whatever fluid it is we're thinking about at any imposed stress, we quickly transit to its homogeneous constitutive curve without any necking yet having occurred. And then you neck at a rate shown by the color scale here with drastically quick necking in this regime and much slower necking in that regime. OK, so let's focus on one particular of those models. Um, that's the that's so-called the Rouse linear entangled polymer molecule with finite chain stretch. 
Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the underlying microscopics of what happens to the polymer chains in these different areas. Um, so in this area, we have Newtonian response, where we're shearing more slowly than the timescale for the chain to disengage from its tube by the process of reptation that I talked about the other day. So you're just riding along on the dynamics that are there when you have Newtonian response. You then cross the timescale for the chain to escape its tube, and so you start nonlinearly influencing the flow by uh, the, the, the dynamics by the flow that you're applying. And you get this uh, very severe thinning effect. Uh, there's then a faster rate associated with this breathing mode, the stretch mode of the chain within its tube, but not rotating back and forth and escaping from the tube. And when you cross that uh, faster rate with your flow rate, um, you start to get chain stretch, which is then mitigated by putting in the, the, that chain stretch must, must eventually saturate because of course any polymer molecule only has a finite length and it can't stretch out indefinitely. So, so these are the four main uh, key regimes and you see a, a very different rate of necking in each regime according to the flatness or the steepness of the curve. So what we can do just finally um, to, 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 what we want to do is say to any experimentalist, well, at any given experiment where we're imposing any given level of stress, we've transited quickly to the constitutive curve. And then we want to ask as a function of the accumulating number of Henke strain units, um, so how much the filament as a whole has got stretched out, how quickly do we neck? So to do that, what we're going to do is turn this axis around. So we have now the, so this is this constitutive curve that I've shown before with this, the, the um, stress now shown as the independent parameter, which is somehow makes sense because that's the experiment you're doing, you're measuring the stress. And then you quickly go to the constitutive curve with this strain rate. You then want to ask as a function of the accumulating strain, um, so how much the filament has got stretched out at any given strain rate, how much have you necked by any given strain that has accumulated? And that's actually what these contours show. So at any given stress, um, as I said, you quickly zip up to the constitutive curve, the strain continues accumulating at a rate that's prescribed by that curve. Um, as a function of that accumulating strain, each time you cross one of these contour lines, you neck by a little bit more. Um, and so we can see that um, in this regime where the constitutive curve is flat, so that when it's turned over, it's steep. Um, and this is the regime of um, saturated orientation, chain orientation. Um, you very quickly cross the contour lines. So this is really catastrophic necking. So you don't have to go through many Henke strain units before you've accumulated a massive amount of non-uniformity along the chain. And in fact, the filament is probably broken. Whereas if the stress is in this regime where you're being very strongly stabilized by the fact that the polymer chains are getting stretched out, but haven't yet saturated in their stretch, then you can actually, um, you will cross these contour lines very, very much more slowly. So in other words, um, you can stretch this filament out in an inordinate length. And of course, um, you're probably not gonna get to 15 Henke strain units in the lab because by that time, you, you're, the length of the filament will be exponential uh, to the 15, e to the 15 of where you, you started. So by the time you've gone too far up here, you've I don't know, got to the length of the universe or something. Um, Okay, at least by the time you get to hundreds of Henke strain. Um, all right. Okay, what, so, so we've talked about the protocol where you start with an unloaded filament and apply a stress to it, and you then ask how you neck um, subsequently. Um, as I said, actually, the more realistic, uh, the, the thing that's more often done experimentally is to start with a filament that's initially unstretched um, and un, un, um, unstressed, and then you jump the Henke strain rate to some value and you hold it constant. And then initially in a uniform way, um, the filament will stretch out, the stress will start growing. It will start growing to the value that it has on this steady state extensional constitutive curve, steady in terms of the stress and the strain rate. Of course, the filament is not steady in the sense it's constantly stretching out at this strain rate. And we want to ask at what time or strain does necking start? And in particular, um, does that correspond to any experimentally identifiable rheological signature, such as what Considair would tell us, an overshoot in the force as a function of strain, or some characteristic feature in the time evolving stress signal? Because actually in rheological um, measurements, it's more common just to track what the bulk variables are doing as a function of time or strain rate or whatever it is, 
and it's less common to actually look inside the sample and see what's happening. So we, what, want to, what we want to be able to do is to say to an experimentalist, uh, we're predicting as theorists, as a theorist, that if you see this signature in your bulk rheological signals, you, you might want to be alert to the fact that stuff is happening inside the sample that you might not uh, have thought about, such as, for example, the filament becoming non-uniform uh, along its length. Now, of course, in filament stretching, where you can look at the filament, that's rather easy. In shear banding, it's much more difficult to look inside the sample and, and, and image the velocity field, although um, people do, do do that. So the group in Lyon, for example, has really taken forward looking at the flow fields inside the shearing fluid using um, ultrasound velocimetry. All right. So let, let's now talk about the second calculation. So the equations of motion are just as before, and as I say, have the structure that we've been talking about throughout these lectures. And we want to think about an initial uh, base state, which is the homogeneous solution of these equations um, in the protocol where you're stretching out at a constant Henke strain rate. So you solve these imposing by theoretical fiat, but everything remains uniform in Z. And then you add to that small amplitude perturbations that tell you about um, the development of heterogeneity along the filament that corresponds to necking. So things now start to depend on Z and um, things also depend on time because it's that time dependence that tells you how quickly these undulations will grow. All right, so here are the constitutive curves that we talked about before, one for Olroyd B, uh, one for Gizekus and Feeney P that actually overlap, and three for different incarnations of the Rouse linear entangled polymer model. Um, so, so this is this concept of once we're stretching the filament out in, a, in an ideally uniform way, if, if indeed we can, it may be a theoretical idealization, you have this relationship between the tensile stress and the strain rate. Now let's focus on just one of those, which is the one that we've talked about before, actually, for the case of the constant imposed stress, which is the um, Rouse linear entangled polymer molecule with oh, chain with stretch. that is a finite chain stretch. Um, I just got a bit of feedback on the line there. If anyone, if that's troubling you, feel free to interrupt me. In fact, I'll stop to ask if you can still hear me because that, that sounded rather peculiar. Yes, uh, there was a little interruption with the internet, but we can hear you uh, well now. Right, thank you. Um, while we're stopped, are there any questions up to this point? So one question here. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I was wondering if like in practice, the necking always happens like in the middle of the filament or like if it more often there's like some defect in the filament and it happens elsewhere, like or originates elsewhere. Mm, that's a very good question. Yeah, thank you. So of course, what we're doing here is being vastly oversimplistic theorists and assuming that we can start with a completely uniform filament um, and ask about the fate of necking perturbations along it. Um, what happens in experimental practice are two things. Now, imagine you could design a complex fluid that won't ever neck according to this calculation. So it doesn't have any, quotes, material instability built into it. Whether you could design such a fluid or not is a moot point, but let's imagine that you could. Um, now let's imagine putting that in a filament stretching rheometer and, and stretching it out. Typically what you do actually, because you're thinking here of very highly viscoelastic uh, materials, is that you would somehow clamp it to, to each of the plates or it somehow sticks to each of the plates and then you, you pull it out. Now, of course, at each of the plates, if it's really stuck to the plates or clamped to the plates, then it can't thin down at the, at the end where it meets the plates, but it must thin down in the middle by mass balance. And so what that means is that that simple effect, which is to my mind, nothing to do with the material instability of the kind we're talking about here, but is a simple consequence of clamping at plates, that seeds heterogeneity that automatically has a little bit of pinching in in the middle. And so I guess what I would argue, and the way we always argued this towards the end of our papers on this, is that, is that it's that pragmatic experimental feature that then gets picked up by the intrinsic material instability, mechanical instability that we're talking about here. So that's basically a long way of saying that I think because of that and because of the symmetry, the left-right symmetry of that, if, um, I mean, it may sag a bit under gravity, I guess, too, in a filament stretcher, but, but if you're just thinking about the left-right symmetry of, of 
filament without gravity, <laughs> the theorist speaks, uh, being stretched out uh, and having this clamping effect at each plate, then it I think it will get seeded in the middle. Yes. And it usually does seem to be in the middle. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. OK, thank you. Any more questions while we're stopped? I don't see any more questions. OK, thank you. So I must apologize at this point. We're way not going to get through all three of these surface instabilities, but I think it's better to do one thoroughly rather than skate through them all. All right. Um, OK, so, so we've talked about the um, We've talked about the constitutive curve and uh, we're focusing in on this Rouse linear entangled polymer model with uh, finite chain stretch. And this is this uh, concept of this stationary constitutive curve where that describes the relationship between the stress and the strain rate in a filament that's um, in this steady stress state but is uh, uniformly thinning out. Now, of course, starting from time zero, where we started with an unstretched and unloaded filament and we started straining it. Uh, the stress would, of course, initially be zero because it was unloaded. And so you don't get to this, uh, this constitutive curve instantly, but there's some time progression where the stress builds up from the sample having been unloaded um, initially. And as it gets stretched out, the stress uh, develops. And eventually, in a calculation where, first of all, we impose by theoretical fiat that the no necking can occur, um, this stress will build up until it gets to a steady state that's prescribed by this constitutive curve. So um, this is a calculation where, as I say, this is what we call the homogeneous space state in the language of a linear stability calculation is that we take the liberty of being a theorist and being able to prescribe that the filament has to be thinning in a uniform way. Um, so, so this is the stress as a function of time were the filament to be thinning uniformly. It may not do in practice, but so uh, we can impose that it must theoretically. And the eventual stationary state of all of those is that uh, is the one that's reached at each of these, um, these indicated shear rates here. The force is the product of the stress times the, the cross-sectional area of the filament. Now, um, the stress is, of course, increasing, but the area is decreasing, and those two effects compete with each other. And so the force increases and then decreases as a function of time. Now, what would Considere tell us? Um, Considere tells us uh, that we should expect to have necking of the filament when the force is a decreasing function of the Henke strain. Df by d strain is zero. Now, the strain is just the strain rate, which is constant in each of these experiments times the time. And so Considere therefore tells us that we'd expect to see necking when the force goes through an overshoot as a function of time. Now, is that what we find? Well, actually, we don't. Um, so I haven't, I've, I haven't gone through the details of this, this calculation, but it's actually fairly easy to do in a few lines if you wanted to work through it yourself. And you can find the, um, the answer in the, there was a PRL that I published. Um, I don't remember the year, um, 2010, probably around about there, uh, early 2010s. Um, and you can show that um, you get an eigenvalue to the onset of necking. Now, this eigenvalue, I should say, is a slightly fishy concept here because what we're doing is saying at any time, freeze the time dependence of the base state and do a linear analysis and ask whether the eigenvalue is positive. Um, that's a bit of a fishy concept. What we can also do is integrate up the linearized equations over time without relying on the idea of a frozen eigenvalue. And we find essentially that perturbations start growing where the eigenvalue becomes positive. So the eigenvalue, although a bit fishy, theoretically is, is actually a good guide to when you're going to get necking. What we find is that the eigenvalue actually becomes positive when, um, so there's some stuff here, there's a prefactor that's positive. Um, this is the um, uh, d uh, stress by d strain, or therefore equivalently to within a prefactor d stress by d time. So this is always positive because the stress is always increasing. And there's a curvature term here that says, because of the signs of all this other stuff being positive, it says that when this curvature becomes negative, the eigenvalue becomes positive. So what this tells you is that if the tensile stress as a function of time goes through an inflection point, um, that's when you should expect to see, um, oh, okay, right. I was just having a moment of horror that I've marked the inflection point wrong here. Um, this is the inflection point d2 sigma by dt squared, uh, if both of them are plotted on a linear scale. 
they're both here plotted on log scales, so the inflection point doesn't quite show up in the right place. So I think this is in, in the right place, um, although probably this is drawn on actually for pedagogical purposes here. But, but in any case, it's when, when plotted on a linear scale, the stress as a function of time starts curving downwards. Okay, so that's one, but in fact, we find two possible modes of instability. One is this so-called stress curvature criterion. And of course, um, if the stress is going to attain a steady state, which it always does in this base state, if, if a steady constitutive curve exists, which it always does uh, in any model in, uh, in homogeneous uh, stretching, then if you're going to get to a steady state, you always have to curve down to get there in the end. And so you're always going to start necking in the end, which is of course what, what we showed earlier anyway. There's also another mode which actually doesn't crop up, doesn't happen in practice in many of these models, but which nonetheless is theoretically possible, which is that, uh, and I call this a modified considere criterion, and it says that the eigenvalue is positive when the derivative of the force, when, when some derivative of the force with respect to some strain is negative. Now this isn't the same as the considere criterion, what this is is a very peculiar concept, which is to say, evolve the base state, the homogeneous base state up to some point in time, then freeze everything, then switch off the relaxation terms in your constitutive model, rendering it a purely elastic model, and then evolve forward in the next time step to see whether the force in that hypothesized model where you've switched off any vis viscous re viscoelastic relaxation is zero, um, and if that very peculiar derivative, which I don't think, I don't know how you would measure that experimentally, perhaps you'd strain at some finite rate and then strain in the next increment infinitely quickly. Anyway, I don't know that that's ever been done or whether it could be done, but nonetheless, it's a very peculiar thing and it doesn't correspond to what an experimentalist would see the force as a function of time. And actually it's that mode is not present many times anyway, it's usually this mode that we get. Right, so having talked through all of that at the level of sketches, now let's look at some real experimental results. So here's the constitutive curve, which you're hoping you might attain in practice. Um, and then, um, so in each experiment, we're imposing some strain rate and we're trying to measure this stress as a function of time, but as a function of the accumulating strain along the filament. So as the filament stretches out, you want to know how much you've necked by any given strain. And each of these contour lines tells you how much you've necked by by the time you get to any given total imposed strain along the filament. And what we find is that in the region where the constitutive curve is flat, just as we showed before, you neck very quickly, you cross the contour lines very quickly. So you don't, you can't stretch the filament as a whole out very much before you've crossed a lot of contour lines and the filament may have broken. Whereas in this re regime where chain stretch is rapidly increasing and hasn't saturated yet, the stretch provides a very strongly protective effect against this necking instability. And so the contour lines here are what we get actually by not relying on anything to do with an eigenvalue and just integrating up the linearized equations on the computer. And then I've marked on here the various criteria that we get um, as, as talked about here. The modified considere criterion, as I said, actually isn't present at all in this model. The original considere criterion is here, but we find actually that the modified that the stress curvature criterion does very much better. Um, the considere doesn't do too bad a job actually in this model, but it generically doesn't hold. And in any case, the, the stress curvature criterion is, I would argue, the right one and, and gets things much better. All right, so that's all um, looks a little bit like theory Neverland so far, because I've not shown you any data on this, but now here's some real data on, uh, well, here's a sketch from a, at least a real review article of experimental literature, and then here's some data. And what this is, is the Henke strain, at which the filament actually, I think it's the filament actually breaks at this strain as a function of the imposed strain rate. And this is written here as a Weisenberg number, and that's exactly the strain rate multiplied by the relaxation time. And uh, what you see here actually is a very pleasing apparent level of agreement between the overall structure that they see. So they see increase at, uh, so, so as a function of increasing Weisenberg number, they see um, slow necking originally as a function of accumulating length of the filaments and then much faster necking and then much slower necking, you can stretch out to, to much longer Henke strains and then, um, and then less again. So um, this was a very nice piece of reassurance. I think that this, this kind of um, theoretical prediction is, is somewhere in the right ballpark.
Okay, so that's everything that I want to say about um, necking. I'm now in a bit of a bind because if the next one takes as long, then we're going to be here forever because we've only got half an hour. But um, so we've predicted that necking will inevitably arise in complex fluids unless for some reason the extensional constitutive curve has a region of negative slope. Um, the only case where I know that that might happen is where I, I think it might be the case that you have a region of negative slope in systems that have a coil stretch instability, although I'm a little bit shaky on that one at this point in time. Um, we've moved beyond the consider criterion of elastic solids, and we've done criteria uh, calculations at constant stress and constant strain rates, and we've shown that they hold in uh, lots of different constitutive models, and we've captured four regimes that are seen experimentally in entangled polymers. Um, so uh, I hope that goes to, to illustrate the fact that if you do what can often be very simple, simple sort of back of the envelope linear stability like calculations, you can actually get quite a long way to understanding um, things uh, as a theorist that really plague experimentalists and that they, they have to worry about every day in the lab. Um, I'll pause at this point to see if there are any questions on the necking stuff. And then what I'll try and do is a, a quicker sprint through the edge fracture stuff. I don't think for a moment we're going to get around to... Uh, to the wall slip actually, unfortunately. So, uh, but yeah. Does anyone have any questions on the filament stretching? I don't see any questions. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll just carry on into the edge factor case, but if if um, maybe Brad, you could look around the room and if there's any stronger appetite to hear the wall slip, I'll, I'll divert to the wall slip, but otherwise I'll talk about the edge fracture. Um, that seems agreeable to people. Okay, all right, that's fine. Good. Actually, this is more instructive in a way because this turns out to be another example of a layered fluid instability, which we've already talked about in the context of these interfaces in shear bands. So it shows how one piece of physics can help understand another as well in some sense. All right. Um, and, and actually by symmetry with this Part of the talk, it's also talking about what's called a free surface instability, which is an instability that happens where a layer of fluid meets, meets the outside air. So the basic thing that we're talking about here, and remember I've rotated the axes compared to what we're normally thinking about, so we've got fluid sandwiched between plates, and we're shearing it here. In this case, most of the sketches throughout these lectures so far have had the top plate moving from left to right. Here it's moving from um, front to back into the board. Um, and the shear field that's therefore being set up looks like this. And then so far throughout the talks, we've assumed that the vorticity direction, which I've denoted Z into the board is always neutral and nothing really interesting happens. Although we did see undulations along the interface in the shear banding case actually. <clears throat> but here we've rotated now to have Z in this direction. And it's this direction in which very often we have um, a, a, an interface where the fluid meets the outside air. Um, so for example, and I'll just try and uh, skate right back if you'll just uh, be patient for a moment. Yeah, so if you have a, a rheometer here, then indeed the, um, yeah, so here, here's an example of a rheometer. So concentric cylinders and you have a, a sample of fluid here, the flow direction here is around the theta direction, the gradient is in the r direction, and then the neutral or vorticity is in the z direction. And you can see here that you're, if these, uh, this is open to the air at the top, that, that where the fluid sample eventually terminates, you'll have an interface between the fluid and the air that will indeed have the interface normal in the z direction. Okay, so now let's skate all the way back. Sorry for the delay. Okay, so, so this is this neutral Z direction or not so neutral as it turns out because this uh, um, uh, instability, th this interface between the fluid and the outside air often goes through an instability which then often actually just terminates the experiment. So I'm going to talk first of all about how widely edge factor is seen experimentally and I'll talk about uh, again an early example of a criterion that was put forward for the onset of edge fracture and uh, what we tried to do in our group was actually develop a new criterion that was understanding this um, edge fracture in a, in a fuller way and giving a, um, a mechanistic understanding of it and uh, also a prescription for when an experimentalist might expect to see it and also a possible mitigation strategy. Okay, so what we're doing here then is um, uh, 
so, so the aim in an experiment, as I said, and I've rotated the diagram back round now, is to shear fluid between parallel plates, and you might aim to measure the flow curve, the shear stress against the shear rate, for example. But in a rheometer, and actually here uh, I've drawn a so-called cone plate rheometer, so this is a plane with a cone spinning round on the top of it, and now the flow direction is round this way, so I could have saved myself the trouble of going all the way back there. The flow direction is round this way, the gradient direction is this way, and the vorticity direction is this way. If the gap is narrow here, so a narrow angle and you're far enough out, then you more or less actually have a region of planar shear round here. So I'm going to approximate all this as planar shear. So gradient direction Y is usual, flow direction Z, uh, sorry, flow direction X in and out of the board now, vorticity direction Z. And what happens is this interface destabilizes and this really hampers experimental rheometry because you can actually find that the sample just is ex expelled from the flow cell and then the experiment ends at that point. And here, again, nothing like a comprehensive survey of the literature, just some, um, some examples, a quick skate over it. So uh, perhaps the most telling one here is this experiment here, where um, you, you start out with a sample of fluid. Look, this is looking in through the side of, I think, a plate plate rheometer. So you have a gap of a wedge of a, a sandwich of fluid between two plates, and one of them is rotating. Uh, the experimentalist neatly trims the sample at the start of the experiment. If the shearing is done slowly, that edge stays trimmed, but if it's done quickly, the edge destabilizes. And at this high shear rate here, it destabilizes so much that you've seen this lovely goo come out of the side of the cell here. So um, frankly, when I see snapshots like that, it makes me quite glad I'm a theorist, I think sometimes. Uh, so, so this is a, a real problem that experimentalists have to put up with so much in, in the stuff that they do, particularly shearing highly entangled polymeric-like fluids, including worm-like micelles, actually, at a very high uh, flow rate. And there's some very nice work, actually. There's a nice paper done by Peter Olmsted trying to understand what happens when you have both shear bands and edge fracture in the same cell, which is a, a very nice work in Journal of Rheology about 10 years ago, I would say. And in fact, it's, it's been said that, that uh, uh, by these authors, but also many others, that edge fracture is actually the limiting factor in experimental rotational rheometry, or torsional rheometry, as you might call it. So um, compared to the ubiquity of it experimentally, actually, this effect has been very little studied theoretically, at least until the work that, that we did in this group um, in the last five years, but there was a very, very nice early study by Roger Tanner from Sydney. Um, and he put forward a scaling argument. Now these axes are all labeled differently from the ones that I've labeled. So please ignore the axes, but as usual, you have flow, uh, gradient and vorticity. And this was obviously done in the days when sketching stuff on a computer was quite tricky. In fact, I think I was in primary school when this work was done. So um, they were assuming a semicircular crack, but it's drawn actually here as a notch, but it was assumed to have some radius A. So they made several quite severe assumptions. They assumed that the flow field is only round in the theta direction, uh, that it is as for a Newtonian fluid. And they assumed a very simple viscoelastic constitutive equation. That's a so-called second order fluid. And remember, we talked about the second normal stress in the first talk, which is the difference between the gradient, gradient and vorticity, vorticity components of the, the normal stresses. They argue that that is destabilizing because that's the difference between this component and this component, and that surface tension is stabilizing. And they said to expect fracture when the amplitude of the second normal stress difference is actually usually a negative quantity, exceeds the surface tension over the pre-assumed crack radius to within some order one prefactor. So this was a really very nice early attempt to understand edge fracture, uh, and it formed the, the basis of, uh, of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, there are various quite severe assumptions in this calculation. And in fact, when I was at a rheology conference a few years ago, um, Roger Tanner, who's now emeritus at Sydney, but still uh, very actively goes to conferences, I uh, jumped out at him from behind a pillar at coffee time one, one conference and said, uh, well, what about all these assumptions in your calculation from 1983? And uh, with extremely kindly good grace, he uh, encouraged me to go and have another look at, at that calculation, which was then really a nice motivation for the work that, uh, that we did on this. Um, so what we're going to talk through is actually a simulation study of edge fracture. And this is a nice example where actually we used a lot of the, ex the, the numerical methods that we used in this study are basically entirely as I talked about the other day, except that we have an additional equation for a field that tells you whether you're inside the fluid or inside the air. And 
remember yesterday I cheated by assuming a bi-periodic box, whereas here we have hard walls in this direction. But, but otherwise, the, the methods are very similar to the ones that I talked about the other day. And as I said, we're always going to assume planar shear, which is valid in certain limiting conditions of these curved devices in which flow is normally done. So we have a cell, a wedge of fluid, and it's being sheared by moving the top plate into the board. Um, and you have a, a width of the flow cell, a length of the sandwich, and a length of the flow cell in the vorticity direction. Uh, you have a modulus of the fluid and a relaxation time of the fluid. You have a viscosity of the outside air. You have a, light, a, a slightly diffuse width of the interface between the fluid and the air. Remember, we, that was a very important concept in the interface between shear bands the other day. Here we're thinking about it in the interface between the fluid and the outside air. And there's also a surface tension of that interface. And remember, as always, flow direction X is into the board and I'm here going to assume it's neutral and nothing happens in that direction. We're just simulating the flow gradient direction and the vorticity direction, which is the direction in which there's the interface normal. So uh, the uh, slightly more complicated uh, than this, but this is the basic structure of the equation. So we've got incompressible flow. Um, so this is the same structure that you've seen now time and again in these talks. We've got a generalized Stokes equation. So um, uh, the Newtonian solvent term, pressure term, and then it's extended to account for the fact that you have in any fluid element within the bulk, you have stresses due to the polymer chains where like my cells, whatever you're thinking about. There's also an additional stress here, which tells you about the fact that you have now a surface tension at the interface between the fluid and the outside air. Remember that we discarded that in the extensional necking. We we're thinking about highly viscoelastic filaments where it's not relevant, but here we're including it. You need then a viscoelastic constitutive equation for the stress. Remember more properly, you should actually write the stress as a function of the strain variable of the polymers, for example, and write down an equation of motion for the strain of the polymers. But often phenomenologically, you just write down an equation for the viscoelastic stress. The thing that you haven't seen before in my talks, but I'm sure you probably will in, in other talks, is the fact that what we have here is a phase field, which is phi, which varies in space and time. And it's one inside the fluid and minus one outside. And then you have a diffusion-like equation, which says you, um, you uh, uh, move down gradients in chemical potential that gives then a diffusive-like dynamics with a mobility m. This chemical potential has a uniform piece which tells the air and the fluid that they don't want to mix with each other, which is why you have a discrete sample of the fluid. But it also has interfacial terms embedded in it, um, which have a gradient term, which um, is an L squared grad squared, which sets the width of this interface a little bit like in, remember the Frank free energies in the liquid crystal that we talked about. Um, this is just what's called a Carn Hilliard um, equation for, for anyone who's familiar with that. Um, so uh, the chemical potential then gives you a diffuse interface width and that's needed because what you're going to have here is um, so where the fluid meets the outside air there's an interface and where that interface meets the hard wall of the flow cell there's what's called a contact line if that interface is completely sharp that uh, there's what's called the contact line singularity where the contact line is pinned and it can't move it's the fact that you have the slightly diffuse width of the interface that allows the contact line to move you then have an interfacial surface tension and the boundary condition that you apply to this Carn Hilliard equation then tells you about the equilibrium contact angle. So in other words, whether the fluid tends to wet the sample or whether it tends not to wet the sample, which is the case as shown here. And we're going to, we've used a couple of different phenomenological constitutive equations for the, um, uh, for the stress. Uh, so there are lots of parameters, but actually most of them are just tuned to be small. For example, the interface width compared to the box size, the air viscosity compared to the fluid. So the important ones then actually, which really determine the physics of this are the surface tension between the fluid and the outside air, the equilibrium that's suitably uh, normalized in our chosen units, the equilibrium contact angle, the imposed shear rate expressed as a Weisenberg number, so shear rate times the relaxation time, and then each of these models, johnson Sagerman and Giesekus, that we're using has a parameter which tells you how big the second normal stresses get. So you can think of this as a parameter that tells you how big the second normal stresses are. The solvent viscosity isn't terribly important, except for the fact that both of these models can have a shear banding instability in the flow curve unless the viscosity is big enough. And we eliminate that because we don't here want to be thinking about uh, instabilities in the bulk as well as at the surface. So we just make sure that the viscosity is big enough to remove that uh, headache. 
All right, and then we put as an initial condition into our shear simulations, you equilibrate the, um, the liquid air to uh, as, as you get in the absence of shear. Uh, if the contact angle is 90 degrees, that's just a flat interface, then to see the instability, you, we perturb it slightly uh, by perturbing the interfacial profile. Um, and then we want to know, does that initial perturbation grow or decay as a function of time? And here's what we find. And this is just doing a full direct nonlinear simulation using the kind of techniques I talked about yesterday. Um, so this is fixed surface tension. And with increasing shear rate, you find that the interface can either stay flat or it can partially fracture, but settle to a new and stationary bowed state, or it can fully fracture where you get uh, the air from the outside completely invades the walls of the, the flow cell. So this is starting to look something like the experimentalists see and have to have to worry about. Um, here we've explored just one uh, fixed surface tension and three different values of the shear rate. You can actually plot a phase diagram in the full plane of the surface tension and the shear rate. And these are the three um, profile snapshots that we talked about before, which I've shown again here. And they really exemplify this state where the initial um, flat interface state, and we've assumed a contact angle here of 90 is flat or where it bows, but attains a steady stationary bowed state, or where you get a fracture propagating in from the wall and you get this, this phase diagram here. You see this funny reentrant region here, which is quite peculiar. I may mention that again later on. Um, we checked uh, that you get, uh, this is robust against the choice of constitutive model. Um, perhaps need to say more about that. Let me just show you some movies of the simulations because I think they're, they're quite cool. And, and also this shows you, um, what happens when you have more or less wetting so according to the contact angle at the wall of the cell so if it's a relatively wetting fluid you see that uh, the fluid indeed wets the wall of the flow cell and the fracture comes in in the middle of the sample um, neutrally wetting case uh, which is probably uh, something you're not exactly going to get in practice but the movie looks like that and perhaps more instructively when it's less wetting um, as you might expect the fluid de-wets the wall and the air comes in and invades the cell from the, the, uh, the walls. All right, so we've done a nonlinear calculation for edge fracture. Uh, fracture. Um, that perhaps is putting the cart before the horse, because at least in the theoretic, in the shear banding case, I talked about doing a linear stability analysis first and then understanding it, and then um, showing that what the linear stability analysis predicts you get in the nonlinear simulation. Here, we've done it the other way. We've done the nonlinear simulation. Can we now understand that with a linear stability analysis? Well, the simulation that I just discussed uh, with walls turned out to be very hard to do a linear stability analysis for that. At least I tried and failed. If anyone here can do it, please go ahead. But what I did manage to do, what we did manage to do is a linear stability analysis where you have bi-periodic boundary conditions. So this is what's called Lee's Edwards boundary conditions, where you have periodically repeating in the gradient direction co-sliding boxes. Um, and that turned out to make the analysis so much easier. And we reassured ourselves that you get the same phase boundaries more or less between the two cases. So I don't think we're removing any understanding, particularly by going to the biperiodic case. And we also we simulated that too, to check that you get the same behavior. Another simplification that we're going to move towards because you don't now have a contact line you need to worry about without walls. So we, we assume the interface is thin and we took the air viscosity to zero. And so what we do, and this is the final example you will see in these talks of a linear stability analysis, but it really shows you how far you can get in these complex fluids by doing these simple linear stability analyses. Um, so we did the usual thing of assuming an initial base state, which is, so I'm looking here only at the left-hand side of the, the uh, box. So we have the fluid and the air and an initially flat interface between them. So this is our initial base state, our zeroth order homogeneous base state in the calculation. Um, we're assuming that the fluid has reached a state where it's flowing with the stresses prescribed by the constitutive curve. So the shear stress is a function of the shear rate and so is the second normal stress. And then we do a linear stability analysis where we add small amplitude perturbations in the interfacial profile of flow fields and the stress. We substitute all of that into the governing equations, which I wrote down a few slides ago. And we expand those governing equations to first order in the amplitude of the perturbations. And we throw away second order terms because they're small. And doing so, you get um, 
a solution that you so because we've now got periodic boundary conditions in the y direction it means we can have Fourier modes in the y direction which makes life so much easier um, the time dependence is characterized by eigenvalues omega showing here is w i'm sorry and then we also have perturbations uh, that we have to worry about how they depend on z and and, and as you might anticipate because this is something that's just happening at the interface you actually get exponential decay of these perturbations as you go away from the interface on some some length scale and it turns out that the eigenfunction of this calculation looks like as i've shown it here and then as usual the eigenvalue is telling us about the time dependence so if all the eigenvalues omega are negative this um, initially unperturbed interface will stay so um, and you don't get edge fracture if you have a positive eigenvalue you do get edge fracture and what we find is uh, that uh, the eigenvalue is positive. Now, this, this calculation is actually a lot more complicated to, to get um, an expression for the eigenvalue than it was in the, in, the, in the pen and paper one that I showed you the other day for shear banding. Nonetheless, actually, you can still work through it at the level of pen and paper. That quite surprised me, actually. I didn't expect to be able to do that. And if anyone wants to be able to do that, you can. There's a PRL on this from I don't know five years or so ago um, by Ewan Hemingway, who is an absolutely superb postdoc in the group and myself. And uh, what we found in that paper was that you have a positive eigenvalue, therefore instability, when the following criterion is met. So um, what you have here is the, um, the surface tension tends to stabilize the interface. Um, this is the wave vector of the perturbation. And this is stuff that knows about the mechanics of the fluid in the sense of the shear stress. Whoops, sorry. Um, the second normal stress, and this is its derivative with respect to the shear rate, and the shear stress and its derivative with respect to the shear rate. And of course, you could just snap these together, and it's the derivative of the second normal stress with respect to the shear stress, actually. And it's these polymers, polymeric stresses and their mechanics that destabilize the system. Um, so here's the um, predicted threshold that we predicted analytically. And here's the, um, the phase boundary that you've already seen from the full nonlinear simulation. And then if you graphed, uh, no, sorry, this is, this, this, is the, this is the analytical prediction. And then the phase boundary from the numerics is later on. Um, this calculation was only ever designed to work at low strain rates. So you can see that you get uh, disparity at high strain rates. Um, nonetheless, we're now in a position to understand this reentrance because what this calculation says a bit oddly, and I don't actually think this is a realistic feature of the model that we used, but a fixed um, interfacial tension as you increase the strain rate, the um, you initially stable, then you're unstable, then you're stable again. The reason this stabilizes is because dm2 by d gamma dot in the simple models that we've used tends to zero at a high strain rate, and that stabilizes everything. I don't think for a moment that's a that's, um, well, I don't believe that that is a, a, a realistic uh, description. So therefore this reentrance might take with a pinch of salt, I guess. All right, um, so there are two ways that we can predict uh, that we can com compare an analytical stability calculation with the full nonlinear simulations. And of course, this is comparing the analytical calculation against what happens in the simulations at early times, starting from an initially flat interface as the undulation is just about to grow, which is the regime that an analytical calculation um, is designed to work in. And uh, it's always very reassuring when you've done a linear stability calculation to predict, to, to, to test it against a nonlinear calculation. Um, and you can, you can test the eigenvalue, which we've already done. You can also test the eigenfunction, which is uh, all this uh, spatial stuff that I wrote down here. Um, and you can uh, plot the eigenfunction as a function of distance away from the interface and height in the gradient direction for both the in-plane velocity and also the outer plane. So that's in the main flow direction. And on the left here is analytics, and on the right is the simulation, and you see really excellent agreement between the two. The interface you can hardly see is being perturbed here, so I've exaggerated here the perturbation in the gradient and the vorticity direction. Um, I talked on this slide here through the comparison with Tanner's original calculation. I'm desperately short of time. I'm not going to do that. Um, you can also think about the mechanism of the edge fracture. This is actually very... Um, instructive, I think. Um, and what you can talk through is thinking about how an initial, so if you had a perfectly flat interface, force balance would be good. As soon as the interface um, uh, ruckles itself slightly, 
um, you have to, you get that exposes the jump in the shear stress across the interface. Um, so to maintain force balance, you need a shear rate perturbation. Therefore, you get uh, a perturbation in the second normal stress. That must be counterbalanced by an extensional perturbation, which gives you a flow field that enhances the original tilt. That sounds very Baroque and pulled out of a hat. You can actually work through all of these layers. And I've actually snapped some of them, two layers into one in, in some of these stages. And at each stage, you multiply the various terms and you actually get back to the um, uh, expression for the eigenvalue that I showed earlier. This is also, by the way, an, another nice example of where you have two layered fluids. The second fluid here is air. Um, where you can layer two fluids and if there's a shear field in them, you're generically, if there are normal stress differences and stress jumps between the two, you're generically unstable to the interface getting undulations along it. So this is another example of an interface getting undulated as we talked about in the context of shear banding. It, this uh, also points to how we might mitigate edge fracture because this sigma, sigma is the jump in the shear stress between the fluid and the outside air. So in principle, you could reduce that by bathing the whole cell in, uh, uh, um, not in air, but in a Newtonian fluid of a higher viscosity. So edge fracture is ubiquitous. And what we've done is a linear stability analysis that we've compared against nonlinear simulations and the two look to agree quite well. I'm not going to have time at all to talk about wool slips, so I'll just cut right to the end where I'll thank various people that, uh, oh dear, I'm very sorry. Um, oops, let me share this at the end. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank uh, in particular uh, postdocs, super postdocs who've worked in my group on these free surface instabilities, Ewan Hemingway, David Hoyle and Gerhard Young, who actually was visiting us in, in Durham. He did the slip stuff. In fact, I didn't have time to talk about. And then on the active fluids, variously over the years, I've worked with Mike Cates, Ramin Golestanian, David A. Marantoso, Tanimola, Liverpool and Julia Yeomans. Um, the shear banding stuff, I must really give uh, sincere thanks to Peter Olmsted for getting me interested in that pro problem in the first place when I was his postdoc, although this, the anywhere I touched into the research was stuff I did actually after I'd left Peter's group. And I should also thank for funding uh, the UK's EPSRC and the EU and the European Research Council. Okay, so thanks again for the invitation to speak and I'd be happy to take any questions, although I've noticed we're up against the end of the slot, but I'd also be happy to find some time, some other time to take questions if that would be more convenient too. Thanks very much. I, I think we have a, time for a few questions. Um, so are there any Sorry, questions? Eating your coffee time, I think that's what it is for you. Yes, okay. Oh. Hi, I was wondering if you could say more about the uh, stress controlled and strain controlled measurements and like why one might do one or the other and uh, yeah, how they work practically, I guess. Yeah, so actually, this is this is ground in which I get to be shaky as a theory. Well, I mean, first thing is to say that you get a different phenomena if you if you control the stress and the strain rate often. So, um, for, uh, so a good example there is the filament stretching case, where because the dynamics are quicker at interimposed stress, um, you can get to the homogeneous um, extensional constitutive curve faster than you can at imposed strain rate. So, actually, although it's a more difficult experiment to do in some ways, technically, you, it actually can give you information that it's more difficult to get in the other case. That's one reason. Um, in the context of shear, I mean, you, you guess the flow curves, if you can reach them, would be um, the same in, in the two cases. On the other hand, very often the dynamics of a system are very different in imposed strain rate and imposed stress. So a good example there is, let's imagine you're thinking about um, something known as a yield stress fluid, where um, there's a you can sustain a certain load, a certain stress without flowing, but above a certain load, you must flow. Now at any non-zero flow rate, by definition, you have to flow. Um, under an imposed stress, you don't flow below a certain stress and you do above a certain stress. And in fact, what happens below a certain stress is you tend to do something called creep where the strain increases without bound, but it's a never slowing rate. And then if you're just above the yield stress, you have a very prolonged period of, um, creep and then eventually wake up and start to flow and reach the flow curve. So you generally get very interestingly different dynamics under the two protocols. And of course, 
that's intrinsically interesting in itself, not least because if you're an engineer using these fluids in practice, you might be doing one protocol or you might be doing the other. So really you need to understand both. Now, where I'm on more, much more shaky ground is this, this whole thing about um, what, a, what a, a rheometer, by which I mean the device, not a person, actually does in practice because, um, and I was actually talking with a couple of experimentalists the other day um, and I was on the Zoom line and then the conversation really got very experimental and they started talking about what rheometers they were using and they said, is it stress controlled or strain controlled? But in both cases, we were actually looking at an experiment which I would think of as being where you impose the strain rate. But it turns out you can actually use a stress controlled experiment a rheometer to do that, but you need some fancy software inside the rheometer that then quickly iterates to get to the strain rate that you want, even though it's actually fundamentally imposing, controlling the stress. But there's some feedback software to do that. So, um, But I'm, I'm much uh, hazier actually on, on that than I am on the other stuff. But it does occur to me that there may be some interesting theoretical calculations to do to try to understand the implications of these feedback loops in very complex, complicated fluids. I think actually Patrick Warren did a nice calculation along those lines some years ago, but I don't recall the details now. Uh, hello, um, I have another question. <clears throat> um, uh, so the f in, 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 in your last part of your talk, so the fluid um, inside two, uh, two parallel plates, mm -hmm. um, you show the stable and unstable region um, in the curve of uh, surface tension and uh, shear, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, shear rate. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, the surface tension between uh, the fluid and the uh, and the sub the plate is very important. So, how does this affect in in that uh, in that? So, if if you increase the surface tension between uh, the plates and the fluid, so let, let's say in um, like it, when it complete wets the surface, mm -hmm. and uh, so so you whether you have the concave and uh, convex uh, scenario of the um, of the interface. Mm. Okay, that's a very good question. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask, can you still see my screen and my cursor? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so what we have, is, so this surface tension here, is, um, so if I understand correctly, this was a, um, a question um, about surface tension between the fluid and the plate. Okay, so there are a couple of different surface tensions we can think about here. There's the surface tension between, um, well, three actually, the surface tension between the air and the plate, the surface tension between the fluid and the plate, and the surface tension between the fluid and the air. Um, those three beating together um, set the equilibrium contact angle. Um, so, so considering all those surface tensions um, together, you get the equilibrium contact angle, which it, it appears in our equations of motion as a boundary condition on the kahn hilliard equation. So that's, that's the parameter that tells you about that. This parameter here is actually only worrying separately about the surface tension between the fluid and the air. Now, what we did, and I skated over this very quickly because I was, I was having to go fast at this point, but actually um, this is the results of simulations. Um, I was using this diagram here as an excuse for switching to a biperiodic box because this is the biperiodic case. But these three curves here are the same phase boundary, actually now in the Giesecke's model, not John Sagan, but that's no, no odds. In this plane of surface tension, and remember surface tension between the fluid and the outside air and the shear rate, um, and this is this phase boundary, but for three different values of the um, contact angle. And so I think what this points to is that actually um, the, the, the instability is not actually too sensitive to what this contact angle is. So here you can be, this is neutrally wetting, and then this is either side of neutrally wetting. Now, admittedly, we didn't go down to uh, you know, crazy values here, um, but we, we don't actually see much difference in, in this effect here. Um, so I think the answer to that question is that, it, of course, it depends on the surface tension between the fluid and the air, because that's what stabilizes um, the, the interface, but it doesn't actually seem to depend too much on the contact angle, which is the quantity in our calculation, which speaks to the um, question that you just asked, I think. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Suzanne for great set of lectures.